You are listening to Be The Change, a podcast of conversations with true visionaries who are creating new paradigms for a healthier planet and society. I am your host, Christine Demick, and my work is in finding real solutions to the biggest problems we face today, climate crisis, capitalism, social injustices, and our failing health. There are amazing humans out there that have answers, and it is my mission to have their voices heard. Together, we can raise consciousness and create a just and equal society. Together, we can be the change. Just when you thought it was safe to go out again, Omicron knocks on our door. In what felt like two weeks, this COVID variant has wreaked havoc on our societal systems and left nearly all of us in a state of confusion. With one in four New Yorkers contracting the variant, including the triple vaccinated, how do we protect ourselves? Today on Be The Change, I am honored to have Dr. Daniel Griffin to help us navigate this maze. Dr. Griffin is Chief of the Infectious Disease Division at ProHealth New York, an infectious disease specialist at Columbia University, and President of Parasites Without Borders. Dr. Griffin's research career started at Memorial Sloan Kettering more than two decades ago and has focused on cancer, infectious disease, and immunology. He is a board-certified internal medicine and infectious disease doctor and active in the clinical care of patients living in the New York area, as well as immigrants and travelers with a multitude of different infectious diseases. I am honored to have Dr. Griffin on today to help us make sense of the chaos going on around us. So welcome, Dr. Griffin. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. I am really grateful to have you on today. And I became a fan of your work on your podcast called This Week in Virology, geeking out there. Um, you know, Not what everyone <laughs> listens to, but not what I used to, but now what do I do? Um, it's also known as TWIV. And you're reporting from the field, sharing information on what you're seeing firsthand. And you speak in a way that many non-medical professionals can understand. So I appreciate that. And uh, needless to say, I'm thrilled to have you here today. But I want to start with with this new variant, you know, it feels like Dr. Griffin, like we knew what was going on. You get vaccinated, you get boosted, you're covered. And now Omicron comes knocking on our door and it's like, you know, it's, it's like all bets are off. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. So Christine, I, I was hoping that your months of listening to TWIB would have you all ready for this moment. So uh, <laughs> I, I thank you for this opportunity because no, I think a lot of people were not ready for this. And a lot of, I think, the challenge that people are struggling with with is this realization that vaccines do certain things. What they're really good at doing is preventing us from getting very sick. And I always use polio as a perfect example, right? The injectable polio vaccine, right? The SOC vaccine. It did not actually protect people from getting infected with polio. People still got infected with polio. They just didn't end up getting paralyzed. They usually didn't know they were infected. That's one of the challenges. Now, the, the Sabin Sundays, right? That was the oral. That actually protected people against infection, but there was a risk with that. And so when people started getting vaccinated for COVID, they thought, oh my gosh, I've been vaccinated. I'm bulletproof. I can't get COVID now. And I think that that was an issue with science communication. Vaccines are fire extinguishers. They cannot keep you from getting infected. The virus, you're still going to breathe. We all breathe. That's one of those terrible habits we have. But when we <laughs> breathe, we can breathe in the virus the virus can start to replicate. Our immune system then recognizes it, then jumps in. But this is already after the virus is starting to replicate. We still make even actually feel symptoms because again, what makes us feel sick? It's our immune system, not necessarily the virus. So people can be fully vaccinated. They can actually feel crummy when they get exposed to the virus. What the vaccines have really done a tremendous job at is keeping people out of the hospital, keeping people from dying, even some pretty good evidence that really reducing, not completely eliminating, but reducing the risk of long COVID. And I think to drive this home, I just saw some data from Singapore. A person with two of those Moderna shots, their chance of dying of COVID is one in 100,000. I mean, I think that really puts this in perspective. But I think everyone was thinking, I can't get infected. I've been vaccinated. What is happening? And I think that's really thrown a lot of us for a loop. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm fully vaccinated. I have two shots of Moderna, you know, going on the subway, no mask, woohoo. You know, not intentionally, but it formed from this is that it 
Do you remember that Dr. Seuss book? The ones who had like the S's on their bellies and the ones who didn't. Do you remember I'm that? a huge fan of Dr. Seuss. I don't know if that's politically correct, but I am. Okay. So, <laughs> so do you I'll remember admit, that? I'll admit familiarity. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. You know, and so you walked on and felt like, or the stars, it was the stars, right? So we all had, you know, I felt like, oh, you had the star and then there's those who did it like really unintentionally turn people against each other. And there's a huge thing. Oh, like, and I never did this, but it was like, you can't hang out with the unvaccinated, you know, because you're going to get sick and all that. And so here we are now, right? And it also happens in Dr. Seuss, which is a great metaphor, right? That everyone ends up with a star and no star and like, you know, they try to get it removed and here we all are, right? And we find out that we can all uh, give it to one another. We can all get it, right? But I think the big differentiation that you're saying here is that it won't kill you. Well, I think that's the big thing, right? Like yeah. when we introduced seatbelts, people didn't stop dying in car accidents. It yeah. just really improved your chances. It, it prevented you from flying, you know, face forward into that steering wheel and ending up disfigured. I mean, that's what we have to realize that the vaccines are incredibly powerful, but they can protect you and they're not going to protect you forever from getting infected. They can reduce that chance of getting infected, probably going to do that for a number of months. And this is this frequent boosting during a pandemic, still trying to work on that superpower a little bit, but it's not a failure. If you get infected with COVID, this is not a moral failing. This is not necessarily a failure of the vaccines. But what those vaccines are doing is they're keeping you greatly reducing the chance of long COVID. You're going to get better in a couple of weeks, probably. You're likely going to stay out of the hospital. You're still going to be here for all those exciting things in life you want to be here for. I think that's really the, the power of vaccines. And it's been tough because I think, um, and you bring up, Christine, you do this great. There's a lot of the patients that I take care of, that I care about, that I'm invested in their well-being, that did not make that decision to get vaccinated. And these are not bad people. I think sometimes this this has sort of gone this direction. I mean, I have one gentleman, he is in the hospital right now. I was taking care of him this Sunday. He was watching old movies. My wife and I are Cary Grant fans, so we're connected on that level. He's a good guy. He's somebody's dad. He's a nurse that I know. It's it's her dad. I mean, he made, you know, what was, I think, not the best decision, but he's not a bad guy. Um, a few weeks ago, I had a, um, had a patient in the hospital, younger man, 40s, weightlifter, very um, healthy in general, but ended up really ill with COVID because he had decided, you know, not to get vaccinated. Now, he's a Rangers fan, so we, we moved past that because I'm an Islanders fan. But no, these are not bad people. These are just people who have made decisions that, that really are not really the best decisions. It's not great for them. It's not great for us as a community. But I don't think it, it helps all this divisiveness, all this shaming that we've seen. No, not at all. And I think there's also some interesting things to look at. You know, I have unvaccinated friend who still hasn't caught it. And it feels like you could walk out your door in New York City right now and you're going to get it, right? <laughs> you know, And I'm wondering if you can explain a bit and all the patients that you've looked at, vaccinated, unvaccinated, do you see any sort of like factor there? What triggers someone from getting it really bad and someone who doesn't? I have a friend who is, you know, one has Moderna and one has Pfizer both really sick, you know, only a couple of days of being really sick, but the fully vaccinated caught it and sick. My husband had it without the vaccine back in March. And it seems like close to that. Now I just had it. I didn't feel as great. I felt like I was coming down with the flu, but never getting the flu. And then my son still has a fever. He's still traveling with it. I don't know. It just seems, and then I hear some people, oh, they just had sniffles. And then some people are triple vaxxed and they're laid in bed for three days or 10 days. Mm -hmm. What is that? Mm -hmm. What is that deciding factor? Well, I think there's two sides to this, Christine. So one is like, why hasn't everyone gotten it? Right. I mean, it's yeah. here, it's out and about. You know, as someone I was talking to yesterday said, if you're living in New York City and you haven't gotten COVID yet, what does that say about your social life, right? <laughs> um, all the cool kids <laughs> have gotten COVID. <laughs> Are you just locked away watching Netflix? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, so that's a little embarrassing. So that is one. It's are you in a situation? Are you going into an office? Are you in a place where you could potentially get exposed? But then the other side, and this is the side that we don't have completely sorted out. There are some risk factors. A person is older. Clearly, the older you are, the higher your risk carrying extra weight. Unfortunately, we've realized that the more weight you carry, the, the more risk comes with that. 
having other medical problems. Uh, maybe you've got diabetes. Uh, maybe you've got an issue that affects your, your immune system. Even male versus female, there's things there. Ethnic groups, um, looks like certain populations, um, racial populations actually have a different genetic background, puts them at higher or lower risk. But there's some aspect to this that is really just random. And by random, meaning we don't really understand what that is. You can have two individuals who see, like I mentioned, this gentleman in his 40s. And unfortunately, I have a police officer right now, just turned 50. He's in the hospital. He's on a ventilator. What happened was a whole group of he and his fellow police officers, they all got covid some of them didn't even notice it, just tested. Some of them, the sniffles. This gentleman may actually die on the ventilator. There's, there's something we don't understand about this immune response to the virus. And, and that's why we encourage everyone to take the vaccine because you just don't know. Are you that person who's going to get the sniffles? Are you that person who's going to spread it to their loved one? Or are you going to be that person who's not going to make it through the acute illness? And right now in looking at, you said you have several patients in the hospital Primarily, are any of them vaccinated? So all the really sick ones are unvaccinated. Um, okay. The ones in ICU, they're unvaccinated. Now, I do have a few who are, who are vaccinated and actually going through them. I'm not sure any of them are under the age of 80, right? You know, And we do know this. The vaccines are not 100% at keeping you out of the hospital. They're not 100% at keeping you from dying. They're, they're great, but they're not there. The people that end up dying, the vast majority of those advanced age, other medical problems going on, the people that do end up in the hospital, you can really tell them apart. The people that are, are triple vaccinated, for instance, Maybe they're in with a low oxygen requirement. Maybe they're in with altered mental status. They're confused because of the acute viral. But though those people that we're really worried about in the ICU, those are the people that didn't make that decision to get vaccinated. Okay. And there really isn't any deciding factor. Like you said, we have seen weight that I knew. I knew uh, diabetes, having that as an underlying condition can sometimes make you more susceptible to this infection, right? Yeah. And it is, it's a hierarchy of risk, but there's still some sort of a Russian roulette aspect. I mean, as people remember yeah. some of the early stories, yeah. I I had, you know, young colleagues, I'm going to say young in their 30s, seemingly healthy otherwise, not make it through the acute illness. Um, yeah. I remember very well one of my colleagues, a young woman in her 30s who ended up on a ventilator and died, you know, in, in April of 2020. No reason, there was no reason for that to have happened that, that we know of. And um, individuals just like that, if they don't get vaccinated, are still at risk. Yeah, it's horrible. I had shared with you that my mother passed away from it. And two weeks prior to that, she was just complaining, wasn't feeling right, really tired. She said, really tired, you know, and drinking tons of water and just didn't feel like herself, tested negative for the flu, went on a plane, which was the worst thing. And what we come to find out is that her blood oxygen level was so low. She landed, was immediately given a blood transfusion to help. Um, we thought she had uh, hepatitis, I don't, you know. We yeah. just didn't know then. But that oxygen level is just sneaky. She was walking around with it the whole time. She was a real estate broker. She was retired. Um, had no idea. No idea. And it seems to hide that for whatever reason. You would think you'd be out of breath, but she was just... Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. no, that, that actually is one of the unique features. And, and I will say unique. This is not really something we see in other illnesses. It, it changed a lot of how we approached uh, critical care here. Normally, as a person starts to have their oxygen level drop, they start to have trouble breathing, and then we provide them with whatever pulmonary support. A lot of times we will check a person's blood oxygen level, and it is incredibly low. They're seemingly um, unaware of how yeah. low it is. That's just wild. Just wild. Well, I asked our listeners to submit questions and I have one from uh, Deborah in Los Angeles. And she asks, besides an N95 mask, if you can get them, right? Taking zinc and vitamin D, is there anything else we can do to up our protection and prevent further spreading with without going back into quarantine? Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest things that we, we can all do is the vaccinations, right? Not only do they protect us, um, those that get vaccinated, but being vaccinated, particularly being boosted, really decrease our risk of getting infected. And then if we get infected, I think this is something people are seeing. A lot of times, even if we feel crummy, we go ahead, we take those rapid tests, they stay negative. A lot of times, even when a boosted vaccinated individual gets infected, gets exposed, they never even generate enough virus to spread it to anyone else. Um, so people are a little confused by that, but I, I think they should be reassured by this. So that's a big thing, vaccination, getting boosted. 
but still continue to make those smart decisions. If you've got the option to be outdoors and do something, um, you know, bundle up and take the dogs for a walk, choosing safer options. We are right now in the midst of more cases per day than we've ever seen. There's light at the end of this tunnel if we have the experience that South Africa, that the UK, that Denmark had. We expect at some point these numbers to peak. We're past the holidays. We expect them to go down. We expect those oral antivirals to be much more accessible. Um, We expect just in the next couple months, you know, if you want to go out to that restaurant, if you want to go to that museum, go ahead, wear the N95. But also maybe you want to sort of postpone that just a little. Wait till the peak is here. Wait till that huge tsunami passes by and then try to look at doing some of those things again. Okay. So do you think someone who's fully vaccinated and boosted is should feel okay being maskless around friends indoors right now? You know, again, it's it's a numbers game, right? If by friends you mean a hundred of your closest friends and everyone has their mask off, that's a little different. Um, <laughs> but if it's half a dozen, if it's you know a, a dinner party, it's every time someone comes in, there is a certain amount of risk. But then I think people need to start asking, right? I, I gave that number, like you know, you and I, Christine, and we're going to think of ourselves as young and healthy, um, vaccinated and boosted. Even if we get exposed, even if we get infected, our chance of dying one in a hundred thousand may maybe even less. You don't get that dinner party back. That Friday doesn't come back. That vacation doesn't come back. That time with your family and friends. And my dad always says, you know, you miss one vacation, you know, you don't get to add it on at the end. So I think people need to start making these decisions. Now, it's a different decision, right? If you've got a three-year-old at home that can't be vaccinated, it's different if you're taking care of your father and they've got, you know, immune issues and they can't get the vaccine protection. So I think we need to start making a lot of realistic decisions um, about what's safe, what's not safe. Well, you know, we did several times. I went to Turks and Caicos because I'll take that vacation. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I did cancel my trip uh, next Friday. Well, one, because my son and I, and my whole family has it. My son's still testing positive, but also because of the infrastructure over there that the variant has crossed the pond and is in Turks and Caicos. And they had to shut down like their air traffic control there because there was, you know, someone who was sick, they had to like sanitize it and like, you know, flights were delayed. It's a very small airport. I don't know if you've been there, but, you know, we felt like it was us going there probably wasn't the smartest decision to just press on their, they're already taxed in many ways. So we opted out of that. Should people really be traveling right now? Do you think, or do you think it's okay? Christine, you You bring up some great issues. So, you know, recently I took a vacation. Craziness. What's an ID doc doing taking a vacation during a pandemic? But (laughs) I felt like I needed a bit of a break. And I think my family wanted a little time. I mean, we went out to Nevada and first we were going to fly back on Saturday and then we're going to fly back on Sunday and then we're going to fly back Monday. Finally, Monday night, um, we ended up with the red eye. I was able to get back for work on Tuesday. But, you know, healthcare workers, we, we oh, we're essential workers. So it's really, but you know, who's flying the planes? Who's getting the food? Yeah. Who's, you know, transportation? And so, you know, you got to think about all these issues. If you go to Turks and Caicos, you may be there for a while and there may even be issues with food. And what if you have a medical problem? So, you know, people have to make those decisions. How how flexible are you? Um, in a couple of weeks, I'm heading off to, to Ghana, to Africa. It's been a while since I've been able to do overseas work. And I'm doing that knowing full well, there may be challenges when it comes time for me to try to get back. I see. I see. For you could even, you could test positive and yeah. maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I could test positive the day before I'm supposed to get on a flight and that changes everything. Then. It does. Yeah. yeah, it does. Okay. I understand that. Now, one thing before we go to testing, I do want to ask you about schools. Do you think it was the smartest decision? I don't know if you have kids in, in uh, school right now, but I do. And we were all good. And we kept to ourselves, just went to a movie. That was the only thing fully masked. And my son goes to school for two days, one, two, comes home the second day, was exposed. And the next day we all have it. Do you think it was a smart decision or do you think this is just us living with it? Well, I think the things with schools and I've, I do have kids, three kids um, all in school. And I've also spent a lot of time, say pro bono, um, working with schools, helping them with plans. Schools can be incredibly safe. They can actually, in certain communities, if you do it right, um, can be safer than the kids being out of school because you know kids get socially isolated and you get a whole bunch of kids together, a suburban home or an apartment, bad airflow. If one of those kids has COVID, everyone has COVID. But if schools have the resources to space the children, to have good ventilation, 
a lot of good studies showing that you can do it safely, but you can also do it unsafely, right? You can put the kids too close together. You cannot put the right ventilation and other measures in place. So I think that school is a priority. And I don't feel like we've prioritized it quite as much as we need to. You know, it's it's keep the bars open and close the schools. And I hate to say, and maybe I'm judgmental, but I don't agree with that. I, I think in-person education for children is really critical. And you don't get that back. You know, you're not going to be an eighth grader again. This is your chance to be an eighth grade. This is your chance to be a sophomore in high school. This is your chance to have these educational experiences. So you can certainly do it in an unsafe manner, um, but you can do it in a safe manner. And a lot of the schools that I've worked with and the ones I keep working with are the ones that listen. We are not seeing issues. We're not seeing transmission in the private schools, in the public schools that I advise in the South Shore of Long Island. You could do this safely, but I've definitely seen situations where things are very lax and uh, rightfully so. Parents are not comfortable sending their children to an environment that they don't feel is, is done well. Well, gosh, I would really love to know what you did in these schools. <laughs> I feel, <laughs> I feel, you know, my son, he, he was double masked. He won't wear the N95 because it's tough. I understand all day and, you know, it's a good eight hour day. But he had on two surgical masks, one on top of the each other, and, and he got it. And it felt like it just didn't take much. And I know he's good. I know he kept it on. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. I don't know. They also, it was like a 30 degree day. They kept all the windows open. Yeah, I I don't know. I somehow feel I'm all for them going back to school, but I have to wonder like during this surge, if we shouldn't have kept them home for, you know, a couple more weeks or had better testing, maybe everyone had to have a PCR test before coming back. I don't know. Yeah, actually, and maybe we're we're segging into testing, yeah. but I think that's an important question is how can we use testing? How can we add that as yeah. a layer to keep kids safe? You know, I was speaking to one of the principals on the South Shore. It was last Monday while I was stranded out in Nevada, which was not the worst thing in the world. No. And coming back from vacation, you know, 10% of their teachers had tested positive, 5% of the students had tested positive. But now let's realize those are the teachers and the students that decided to go get a test. How many of those kids came back and they had not tested, but were positive anyway? And then think about the situation of of eating in the school, right? I mean, you know, it's 30 degrees, it's cold, it's rainy. You know, the mask comes off to eat. That is enough basically to have your child be infected. So unless there's strategies in place, this really can be a problem. And one of the things that we've done in some of the schools, and I think this makes a lot of sense, is testing. And how do you do the testing? One of the things that continues to be true, but we have to keep saying this over and over again, is that the antigen tests really correlate well with infectiousness. And I know there's a lot of a lot of studies out there. There's a lot of controversy. We started doing testing in this Let's Get Back to a Work program in July of 2020. We started doing it with Lionsgate, Netflix, Amazon Prime, all this. You know, I'm taking credit for all the quality show content you get to watch. <laughs> but we have continued to do that successfully without seeing transmission in these settings. And we're doing this thousands and thousands of tests every day. And the schools as well, one of the great things are these antigen tests. They do turn positive. And I'm going to just say nothing's 100%, but 95% sensitive for picking up someone who's got enough virus to spread it to the next person. Um, One of the things we're seeing, and we brought this up a little, with vaccination, with the difference in the speed and kinetics of Omicron, people often now start to feel bad before that test turns positive. So we've got to actually talk about symptoms as well. If you don't feel well, you shouldn't be going to school. If you've got a positive test, you shouldn't be going to school. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about like the viral load, right? So my son, you know, he came home, they gave him two tests. He wasn't asked to test before he went to school. No one was. It's public school, right? New York City. Comes home and he takes it and he's negative. And we wake up the next morning and none of us feel well, okay? But he didn't have a fever yet and I could have sent him to school, but I didn't, right? Because he had a negative test. And I think that is one of the things here is that if you don't feel good, don't go anywhere, right? You know, you should really be staying at home. But from what I'm hearing from you is that the reason the rapid tests were not showing up positive was because it's a viral load. Is that correct? 
I think what's happening, and we're seeing more of this, is that your immune system is is prime. It went to school while all the kids were staying home watching computer screens. And so it doesn't take much virus at all for our immune system to start to ramp up, for us to start to feel crummy. And so it's really changed. Two years ago, people were testing positive, were contagious for a day or two before they had any symptoms. Now we're seeing people start to feel crummy and then not test positive for a day or two. You know, if you're feeling crummy, during a pandemic, stay home, stay home. That next day, if you're still feeling crummy, that's when it's a good time to do that test. So don't waste it on that first day when you're just starting to feel crummy. Take the day off. You know, if you wake up next morning, you feel all better. That probably wasn't COVID. You're probably fine. But if you wake up next morning and you're still feeling crummy, that's the time to do the test. And we see issues here with PCR as well as the antigen. Um, certainly had several patients that come in, I just started feeling crummy this morning, want to jump in with that PCR. It's not positive yet. PCRs and antigen tests, they're all going to miss stuff right up front. We hear more about the antigen failures. I don't know, maybe it's more newsworthy, maybe better access to those antigen tests for the PCRs. Maybe there's a clinician with a little bit of uh, judgment in there. But no, think about it this way. If you start feeling crummy, you might have COVID. Take the day off. Don't expose people. The next day, if you're still feeling crummy, that's the ideal time for that test. Why well, I think it's like, why are people ganging up on them, I guess, is because, I mean, and I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Go right ahead, pile on, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm one of them, but I, you know, I mean, at $25 a pop or whatever, you know, I had them, but I literally gave my son five of them one hour before we got our PCR test, which is tested positive, his antigen tested negative. Yeah. And so I don't know what to make of that. And there you go. I just don't know what to yeah, make no, of this, that. Yeah, no, this is perfect. And this is going to be a challenge. Yeah. You know, the antigen tests are really great for saying, is this person infectious? If you're saying, I got to know if this is COVID or not, that's what the PCR is about. It's the detective, you know, and we see people end up in the hospital. Maybe it's day 11, but now they're having trouble breathing. The antigen test may very well be negative. That PCR is going to tell what started developing 12 days ago, particularly as we discussed with vaccinated individuals. You may never get a high enough level to transmit to others. You may actually go a full illness without ever getting a positive antigen test. Wow. That PCR will pick it up. Now, the problem with the PCRs, that PCR may continue to pick it up for the next month. Yeah. So when a kid gets a positive PCR, is that what they had over Christmas and never knew it? Or is that what's making their nose run now? So that takes a little bit of detective work that takes a little bit of judgment. Okay. So I've got one for you. So my friend yes. Vic, my friend Vic in New York, right? In New York City, before Christmas, a few days before Christmas, her sister-in-law was here from the UK, coming over from the UK. She said, let me get a PCR. There's no line. She goes and gets it. Her and her son test positive via PCR. Okay. Her sister-in-law says, no way. I'm going home. Flies back to the UK. They don't have Christmas <laughs> together, right? Three days later, Vic tests again. She has negative PCR. So does her son. They spend the whole Christmas break negative. Go skiing in Montana. I don't know wherever yeah. she went, yeah. right? She took advantage of it. Comes home. Kid goes to school. And two days into school, comes home. And both children have positive PCRs. So what's that? Like, I don't know. Can you get this twice? That's so horrific. Like in a week? Oh, come on. <laughs> You can get it more than twice, actually. Really? So there's, in the experience in South Africa, they were describing not only a large number of reinfections, people who had Delta now were testing positive with Omicron. Delta only gives you about an 18% protection against a reinfection with Omicron. Actually, a colleague of mine, a clinician that works in the hospital, triple vaccinated, ended up getting Delta in November, got monoclonals, the whole thing. Um, about 30 days later, got sick again, high viral load. It looks like it was an Omicron reinfection that quickly. We have individuals documented four infections. So unfortunately, this is something here to stay. It's not one and done. I have patients that I took care of April 2020 in the hospital on oxygen, decided not to get vaccinated because they were relying on that natural immunity. Yeah taking care of them again in the, in the hospital, reinfected, back on oxygen. This is a tough one. So a couple different scenarios there. Reinfections are one issue. The other is we've had people continue to test PCR positive past 100 days. Mm. 
Okay. But they tested negative in between that week. Yeah. Yeah. Intermittent, positive, negative, negative, positive. Really? Yeah. It's just at a not... very low level. So uh, okay. if, you, if you can get in touch with the lab, which we sometimes can yeah. do, and ask, what, what are those CT values? How much virus? And they might give you a call back and say, oh, a few thousand RNA copies. That helps okay. you. They call you back and say, oh, no, the CT value came up cycle 17. We've got millions and millions. Okay, that's probably a reinfection. Oh, I don't know if any of us know to do that. <laughs> I mean, you, you need a doctor. doctor. That's okay. <laughs> ask, have our doctor. Okay. You can, I, even though it's a pandemic, you can still ask a doctor. <laughs> okay. I feel like there's no doctors available. Like my own doctor, I can't go see unless I'm really sick. You know, they yeah. said there's please because we're overwhelmed and I, I respect that. Oh my goodness. I mean, this is so much. So here we'll go back. Let's I, I know you talked about this on Twib, so but I'd like for you to cover it real quick. Is the stick. Someone said to me, and I post all this on Instagram, is like, you know, that no, we're really sick here, but the rapid tests aren't positive testing. But and then someone told me, take the stick, put it in the back of your throat first, and then put it back up your nose and then test. Right. So they're saying, like, this is what they do in the UK, but I believe that you have to have the right stick to do that. Correct. You need the right stick and you need yeah. the right test. Um, yeah. You know, when you take a test and you want to show, you know, that it's going to work, you actually have to go through. I like to say there's a lot going on under the hood. Um, yeah. You can't just take any stick you want, swab yourself, <laughs> then stick it up each side of your nose and then stick it in the test and think it's going to tell you what you want. There are certain tests and early on, right, we were using some of those tests where we actually would use two different swabs. I'm not super excited about a swab that's been in the back of my throat, but <laughs> I've got my nose. But no, we would use two and they're two different swabs. The swab in the throat is a little bit larger. You know, if you do that and then that goes in the solution, the buffer, you do a different swab that goes in the nose, that goes in. You know, one of the things we have we have seen and we're getting evidence on this is that there, there could be a fair amount of the viral RNA in the mouth it may come up even a little bit sooner, a little bit earlier um, than it comes up in the nose. But there was a recent preprint and the title was really, you know, oh, the best way to test for Omicron is, is in the mouth. But then you look at the data, there's much more virus in the nose. So how does that make the mouth better? I'm not sure. So you got to be careful with those titles and actually read on through. But don't, don't just take a test that's validated, that works for a nasal test and start rubbing things around in the back of your throat. You, you may end up getting a positive, a false positive. Um, you may even end up getting a negative when the test would have worked if you hadn't got all this stuff in the back of your throat stuck on that Q-tip. And I also thought I may end up make myself sicker. I don't know. I mean, like, I like, <laughs> yeah, I did it once. Once was okay. enough. I won't do that again. <laughs> uh, it was terrible. So to clarify, just to clarify for everyone. So if it comes up, your PCR comes up negative, like mine did and the rapid, does it mean that you're not contagious, but you could still be very sick? As you said, you could actually be very mm -hmm. sick, but not yeah. be shedding it. So I think that's an important comment is that yeah. people can feel really crummy, yeah. but not necessarily be contagious. What makes us okay. feel crummy is our immune system. What makes us contagious is having lots of virus. If you've got lots of virus, these tests are incredibly sensitive. But a lot of vaccinated people are going to feel crummy. Their bodies fight it off. Think about when we got those boosters. Some people were down for a day and were not contagious. That was all immune system. Your immune system can really, uh, really give you a whopper. I learned that today as well, that it's not COVID making you sick. It's your immune system fighting it, <laughs> right? Yes. I, I'm glad just but, it, but it's good to let it do that, right? Because it's got to clear that virus. We've seen that, you know, yeah. maybe we'll say those helpful physicians that give someone steroids during that first week, make you feel better. You feel great, but you let that virus keep going. You're going to end up worse off in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Arthur in New York City wants to know if, is this stronger than the flu? I guess does... Are we going to be looking at this more like how we deal with the flu? Although it comes in really big waves. I've never seen everyone get the flu this badly. But, you know, you said we're going to have to learn to live with it. How do we do this? I mean, the best way to learn to live with this is the vaccines. The vaccines okay. have really defanged this virus. So, you know, you look at, you know, a healthy person vaccinated, you know, one in a hundred thousand chance of dying. You look at the flu, right? You know, the CDC says 0.1%. That's one in a thousand. I mean, I, I think that's a little bit, but no vaccines take this. It's still there. It's still circulating. You still feel crummy. It still spreads, but you're not necessarily in the hospital. You're not necessarily dying. 
One in a thousand people die of the flu? Yeah, I think that's an exaggeration, don't you? Yeah. I mean, I trust the CDC and everything they say, but that seems a little bit off. That does seem a little bit off. Someone <laughs> like, I don't know. I think someone well, needs to me... move a couple decimal points. Yeah, we're not um, going to no, talk I mean, about a, the CDC right now. They need a little love. Yeah, no, in a bad flu year, right? I mean, we've yeah. had highs of 60,000 deaths. We've had, you know, um, 100 plus people dying a day for a period of time. If we could get our population fully vaccinated, we would have a lower death rate from COVID than we do from the flu, um, which may just be that we need a better flu vaccine. Yeah, yeah, because it only, what, 40, 50 percent protection? Is that It's right? not great, again, at keeping you from yeah. getting symptomatic disease. It is good at keeping you from dying. Ninety percent of the people that die from flu are unvaccinated. Oh, OK. All right. Good, good to know. Good to know. So unfortunately, we've seen a lot of children suffer right now from this new variant. And so I have a question from Jane from Long Island and, and Kate from upstate New York. They'd like to know more about diabetes in kids. The CDC, they just came out uh, with a study talking about that children recovering from COVID are now much more likely to get type 1 and type 2. Now, I know you know this, that type 1 and type 2 are very different diseases with diabetes, right? One you're kind of, I believe, born with, right? You have a gene for it and the other one is kind of related to food and diet can be controlled that way. Is that correct? I think that's fair. The type 1 diabetes is we've actually lost our insulin producing cells. Our immune system has, has somehow seen them as far and, and destroyed them. Right. Um, where your type 2 starts off with a resistance to the effect of insulin, over time you do sort of burn out those cells as well. So you, you may end up at the end with a type 2 person requiring insulin as well. But, but the mechanism, what drives it is, as you described, very different like that. So why does this COVID infection then cause... Uh high incidence of both or make you more likely to get them if you're a child. Yeah, I mean, and I do believe this data. We started to see this in our, you know, my role at United Health Group where we look at just all these claims and seeing, boy, adults that end up getting COVID, they're more than twice as likely to end up with a new diagnosis of diabetes in the next six months. Uh -huh. um, and then we started seeing this data in the children. We have a couple ideas. One is that COVID really messes with your immune system. Uh, there's a lot of data that you you generate autoantibodies, um, antibodies that target self. So that may be what's explaining to some degree the, the type one. You may be targeting your insulin producing cells with antibodies, destroying them. But the other side is this inflammatory milieu may be interfering with the, the ability of insulin to work. So there may be two sides to why we're seeing this. But I think it does point out you know, COVID is not just a two-week illness. This really wreaks havoc. And we don't even fully know what are we going to see years down the road in all these individuals that got infected. Uh, it's horrific. So now I'm thinking about that with my son, right, who is uh, vaccinated with Pfizer, has it, mm -hmm. tested positive. So is this a concern for him or is it only in the unvaccinated or it's in the vaccinated as well? Yeah, I mean, Christine, I think that's great that you bring this up. Yeah. It seems that the risks in the unvaccinated are significantly higher in the vaccinated. So of things the long COVID. Yeah, so diabetes, long COVID, sort of all the different parameters. So we do think that if your immune system first sees the vaccine, is ready to respond, we do think that they're going to be at a much lower risk. Now, a lot of people sort of slop that data together. I don't think that's right. I think that people who are vaccinated, we are seeing them do much better. We're not seeing those same numbers. Wow. Okay. That's good to know. I'm glad. So I will watch them. But obviously, I guess are there some markers that we should be testing with now with our doctor? No longer a pediatrician, but should he be doing this now? <laughs> Not necessarily. I think for people who were not vaccinated, you know, you probably yeah. want to get in, get that blood work, see how you're doing, because unfortunately, the risk is, is real. But for the vaccinated, it's really a different world. And I think that's the big thing about the pandemic going forward. The pandemic is a very different experience for people who are vaccinated, able to get that immune response, and those people who are either unvaccinated or not able to get that response. That's really important. And I hope that everyone listens to this right now is that, you know, the vaccination doesn't just protect you from the virus, make it easier for you, but it also protects you from these long hauler symptoms that a lot of people have, right? 
Yeah, and we've seen people who've been vaccinated ahead of time have a reduced risk. Um, but we've also seen the sooner after you get vaccinated, the lower your risk of going on to have long-term effects. So getting vaccinated within the first month, a six-fold reduction in that long COVID. Uh, you go out to two months, about a four-fold. You keep going out, still seeing about a two-fold in our studies. So you want to get vaccinated hopefully before you get COVID. But if you get COVID, go ahead, get that vaccine, reduce these risks because we don't want to die. We don't want to end up in the hospital, but we don't want to have all the long-term issues with long COVID. So you could have one of these long-term issues and then go and get vaccinated, right? After of having had COVID and it could reduce the long-term issues, make them better. I have to say, when we first observed that, it was shocking in a very positive way. You know, a lot of the first people that were eligible for vaccines were healthcare workers. Yeah. Um, so these were people we knew well, I knew well, a lot of trepidation. Like, is this going to cause a relapse? You've already had, you know, COVID. And then we started to see the first vaccine, the second vaccine. About 50% of these people were reporting um, significant or complete resolution of these long COVID symptoms. Wow. Um, so really tremendous. We've had a couple studies validate those findings. Wow, I really hope people listen to this. I mean, I have friends who won't vaccinate their kids because they're afraid they won't be able to have children later on because it does mess up with the menstrual cycle. I mean, that's been shown, right? Yeah, um, and so I think, they're concerned. I think that's true. Yeah, we yeah. saw that. That's validated. It does. You will it get, does. Yeah, it's a stress. It is a stress. But the fact is that, I mean, to have your child have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, neither of those, but boy, I have friends who their children have type one. And that is not something that you want your child to have if you can prevent it at all. So get that vaccine. Okay, Dr. Griffin. So I have one more question for you from um, UPINS. I listened to TWIV a couple of weeks ago. It was regarding boosters. It was before the Omicron you know, got really like crazy. And you would discuss that in certain cases that we should really be looking at getting this whole world vaccinated. Not everyone, you don't need three or four boosters. And you've been asked, I mean, will we be getting boosters every eight weeks because they wear off? I mean, like, do we, you know, what are we going to do? Catch COVID and take a pill? Like, what's the end of the story? <laughs> well, I think that's really important. People need to start asking, like, oh, yeah. what is the end game? What is the yeah. exit strategy? Are we really going to yeah. get a shot every four months? I mean, some of us might, right? Healthcare workers around high risk people, um, you know, everything we can do to keep from getting infected. Certain high risk individuals, maybe we're going to figure out what puts someone at a risk of, of long COVID. Maybe they're really going to want to focus on not getting infected. But where did Omicron come from, right? Where did all these variants come from? They come from the fact that we really have not gotten the world vaccinated. So, you know, I would say the most selfish thing, and that's exactly the most selfish thing we can do is vaccinate the world. Not only are we going to protect them, not only going to make a difference, but we're going to protect ourselves. You know, how many new vaccines are going to keep chasing our tail if we don't vaccinate the world? So we need to think of it one of the best things we can do is really get those vaccines out there. Mm. And why aren't we doing that? Yeah, I think this is a political issue, probably. But no, I, I think it's also that we we don't appreciate how important this is. It is not logistically easy. I don't know if it polls well, but it's critical. And it's not just sending vaccines. It's having people there. It's education. It's getting those shots in arms. It's having syringes and cold storage and all the other things that are required. It's It's a big effort. It needs to happen. Um, this is a very time-sensitive issue. Yeah, of course, we had the J&J, &J, which was one shot. Getting anyone to take two shots is like, even someone who really wants it, is, is not easy. How do you feel about like, you know, we'll call them subpar vaccines, but like something like J&J, &J, which, you know, we won't have here, but then shipping it off to another country that doesn't have it. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I'll say first, I'm not sure J&J &J is subpar. I, I got my two Moderna shots and when it was time for booster, I requested J&J. &J Why? They told, me, they told me no. They only had Moderna, so I had to go with that. You know, one of the things about these vaccines is we think the biggest thing that protects us against severe disease and hospitalization is T cells. And those adenoviral vector vaccines, so the J and J vaccine, we really think if you compare about a tenfold higher T cell response. So it may be, you know, give it the test of time. The durability of the J and J may really surprise a lot of people. So one is I'm not sure it's an inferior vaccine, but then, you know, there is that, what is it? one in two million risk of death, right? That's less than ideal. But, you know, again, I say that's how many people die of COVID every four minutes, right? I mean, this is, yeah. you know, a very low risk when you count this. 
So I think that's one thing, but there are vaccines out there that are inferior. Um, I'm not sure J and J's in that class, but there are ones out that they're inferior ones where all they have is, oh, we have antibody, um, correlates of immunity, no efficacy data. I'm not that comfortable with the idea that, oh, we'll just give those to the poor people. I think that this is one of those situations where even not from a morality, but even just from, from an equity, from a doing the right thing, from getting ahead of this pandemic, we want to see people getting effective vaccines, not just any vaccine. Yeah. And I have to say the mRNA vaccines, the, the AstraZeneca, the J&J, these vaccines, pretty impressive. Sometimes you're mixing and matching. That appears to be fine. But yeah, there's there's some vaccines out there that we're just not sure about. Interesting. So you asked for the J&J. Why specifically that you wanted to get the dual? I was going to do that heterologous boosting, right? The, the yeah. mix and match. And, you know, I felt like the Moderna was doing a great job with those antibodies. And I was hoping to get a little bit of a uh, T-cell boost. So maybe next fall, I'll be a little more careful in, in which vaccine site I go to, make sure they have some J&J for my what? next fall boost. So, okay. So you know this, obviously, because you're a doctor of <laughs> infectious disease. But why, why doesn't the public know this? Well, I think it's fine. I mean, I think the mRNA vaccines have done just such a great job. There's a lot of robust data. I use my middle daughter, Eloise, as an example. You know, if you've already got a 95, do you need a 97, Eloise? 95, isn't that good enough? And we're already there, right? I mean, you know, the mRNA vaccines, um, as far as, you know, my risk of dying is one in 100,000. How far am I trying to get that down? Am I going to live forever? I mean, but it's still, it's science. I mean, like the T-cell count, you know, that's a lot of people out there too. And I'm one of them, you know, I was going measuring my, first of all, it was fun to know what my antibodies were, right? (laughs) It's become, I mean, what are you going to talk about at the dinner party if you don't know your antibody levels? (laughs) <laughs> you know, and my doctor was into it as well. And she was curious, you know, and I went from 200 with my first shot, okay, of Moderna, mm-hmm. something like, you know, 2000 with my second shot. And I'm still at 2000. Yeah. So I said, oh, well, all right. Well, then I'll wait on the booster because, you know, and at the time it was like, I don't know, a month ago, things were much different. Yeah. And she said, but it's your T cells. You have to look at everything. And Everyone knows that. And that's very interesting. Maybe I'm going to seek out the J&J now to get my booster. (laughs) You mentioned like watching TWIV as nerding out. But I think people have started to realize like understanding virology, immunology, it's actually helpful. It it helps us make these decisions. And everybody's been very excited about antibodies and B cells. But, you know, the next thing, T cells are going to be what people are excited about. They're not as easy to measure, right? You know, you will have to come up with some values that, that can be discussed well at the dinner table, you know, so people can mix and match. But it was actually about a month ago. I, I had a patient. I took care of him for a couple months, incredibly ill in the ICU. He eventually got vaccinated with JJ, by the way. But his wife was watching those antibody levels and they were super high. They were in the thousands. And then he called me up. He said, you know what? My wife's got COVID. She's really sick. And I was like, why didn't she, instead of drawing those antibody levels, why didn't she just go get vaccinated? So that, that's my my word of wisdom. Stop checking antibodies. Just get vaccinated. Oh, so she was unvaxxed. So she was she unvaccinated because she was tracking those really high antibody levels from her infection back in uh, April 2020. Yeah, I know a few people doing that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just matching them with the vaccine. I was I was actually interested <laughs> okay. in that. But yeah. Yeah, don't delay your boost. Don't delay your initial shots. Don't just check those antibody levels. I mean, if they're fun, go ahead. Enjoy okay. that but still get boosted. So my son who tested positive, when should he get boosted? Yeah, so this this has changed over time and I'm not sure yeah. everyone has kept up with it. You know, early on when we had vaccine shortages, we said, you know, wait 90 days, let everyone else, you know, in front of you get their shots. Don't cut the line, so to speak. But now that we've seen so many reinfections, even within those 30 days right after, um, the CDC and the rest of us said, you know what? Soon as you're no longer isolated for the infected, when you're feeling better, go right ahead. Don't leave that window for a reinfection. Much better to learn from the vaccine than to learn from another infection. That's interesting because I think people think that, and this is what people are thinking. I'm just sharing it with you because you may not know, (laughs) but word on the street, Dr. Griffin, (laughs) is that you don't go get a booster because after you've been infected, you have so many antibodies (laughs) that you would get sick that it would be too much for your body to handle. And that's not true, huh? 
That is not, that is the word on the street, but that, yes. is, not, that is not the correct word on the street. <laughs> uh, well, let's replace that with knowledge. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Having you on here has been fantastic to debunk this, you know, because people who are, I think they are interested in T-cell counts and antibody counts and virology and all of this, but they're not watching TWIV. They're watching YouTube and, and <laughs> you know, random videos. So last question for you is that I asked everyone who's been on the show is that this is your work and I can tell it's your passion and obviously you love it. You know, you have an incredible career in it, but what keeps you going and not throwing in the towel and giving up and like seeing this, like, you know, one thing hitting you after another, a new variant, new this, are you just used to it or what gets you up in the morning and keeps you going? It's my patience. I really enjoy taking care of people. And it doesn't matter to me if you're vaccinated, you're unvaccinated. If a person is not feeling well, I mean, I consider it a privilege to, to be there at the bedside, to hold that person's hand, to find a way to connect with them and find a way to make them better. And I, I think I'm just really blessed to have that. So every day I wake up excited to go and, and see my patients and my new patients um, and try to make a difference. Oh, that's incredible. Well, you are making a difference. Thank you so much. You can find Dr. Griffin on TWIV, which is AKA This Week in Virology. And that's on Apple Podcasts and also on Microbe TV. You can learn more on COVID and other infectious diseases at Parasites Without Borders, which we didn't get to talk about much, which I'd love to have you back and discuss it because that's, that's an incredible uh, thing that you're doing right there. And you're also, you're president of that website. And where else can people find you? Can they have you as a doctor? <laughs> so they can. People can call up uh, ProHealth, uh, Division of Infectious Disease, 516-656-6500. I am booked. I, I know my staff is like, so Dr. Griffin, when are we putting this patient in? Well, that'll be like right after midnight. But no, I, I'm happy to take care of people. So yeah, not only um, do you get to see me and hear me, but I actually am a real doctor and take care of patients. Do you have to have uh, an infectious disease to see you though? <laughs> 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 well, I'll see people if they have questions about COVID and vaccines and exposures. So, okay, good. Okay. And can you please share it? So I know you're active on Twitter. So, what is your Twitter handle? Um, I think it's Daniel Griffin, MD. Is that correct? Okay. All right. I will make sure I'll put it in the liner notes for everyone, but Daniel okay. Griffin, MD. Well, thank you for your time, Dr. Griffin, and thank you for being the change. All right. Thank you. Take care, Christine. Everyone be safe. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and are inspired. We grow with supporters and listeners like you. So please share this podcast with your community and follow us on Instagram at bethechange.nyc. And to learn more about our guests and what you can do to be the change, go to our website at www.bethechange.nyc. That's bethechange.nyc. Thank you and be well.